Hello and welcome to uh, my office and to the this week's installment of Walking Through the Shorter Catechism. Today we're going to look at Shorter Catechism number 11. And so let's dig right in. The question here today is number 11, what are God's works of providence? And it's, the answer is God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing all the creatures and all their actions. There's a few items to dig into today, some of it philosophical, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to get into this question about God's sovereignty together for a few minutes today. So first of all, we see that we have to go back to question eight. And question eight, I told you, kind of builds on the, sets the foundation for some of the latter questions. So question eight says, how does God execute his decrees? And he executes his decrees through his works of creation and providence. And then questions nine and 10 had to do with creation. And now question 11 has to do with providence. So we see in this answer that God's works of providence demonstrate his active sovereignty. God is sovereign. We talked about when we talk about the sovereignty of God, we are referring to God's power over all things. He is sovereign and we say active sovereignty to distinguish from uh, a potential power, a potentiality that he doesn't exercise. We see in the answer here that God not only possesses power, but he uses it. And that power is used in his most holy wise, uh, preserving and governing. So it's an act of sovereignty. God is actively ruling and reigning over all of the universe. And uh, he uh, is doing that powerfully. Now we see here, that this involves all the creatures and all their actions. And when we talk about all creatures, we, we really could substitute the word creations because it's not referring just to animals or anything animate. It is referring to anything created. And of course, all things were created by God as we saw, um, we saw in question nine. A couple of a couple of weeks ago so this involves all creations not just uh, creatures what we call creatures both animate and inanimate so not only human beings but also all the animals all the plants all the rocks all the trees the oceans the weather the celestial movements in, in the uh, in the app in this in the um, in the galaxy in the universe everything all the creatures and all their actions and so all their movements all the hurricanes all the earthquakes all the supernovae everything all things god is actively governing and preserving all the creatures and all their actions according to his most holy uh holiness and all wisdom and so that is what we refer to now this raises some questions here and the question has to do with if god is sovereign like this if he governs all the creatures and all their actions then do we have free will uh, it's an important question people want to know do we really have free will and some would say that if we do not have free will, some theologians and some philosophers would say that if we do not have free will, then we, we are not morally culpable. So it's an important question. Do we have free will? If God is sovereign in this way. The second question is, is God the author of evil? If God is preserving and governing all the creatures and all their actions, does that make God the author of evil? And the, the next question follows from it. Does that mean God is good? 
because we know that evil exists in the world. We see evil around us all the time. We live in, in the midst of a pandemic where all this disease and death is happening. Is God the author of that? These are important questions for us to consider. So let's answer these questions briefly. The first question is, do we have free will? And the thing we have to do is define free will. Uh, what does it mean? And there are two ways that philosophers and theologians have defined free will. The first is libertarian free will. This is the idea basically that, that free will means I can do anything, anything, any possibility. To be truly free or libertine or libertarian, this doesn't refer to politics. It refers to being truly, not truly free. I don't like that word. Uh, totally free, absolutely free would be a better word to use. Absolute freedom. That's another way to think of it. That I can choose anything, really. I'm not constrained at all. That's libertarian free will. And if you have a libertarian view of free will, then that means that it is incompatible with God's sovereignty. God's uh, determinism, uh, the philosophical term is determinism. In this view, free will does not is not compatible with God's sovereignty because of the way free will is defined. But there's another way to define free will, and that is according to the Augustinian definition. The compatibilist position is that free will and God's sovereignty do not contradict each other. And the reason is summed up quite nicely in this quotation by a philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer. Man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills. In other words, we do exactly what we want to do. But what we want to do is not uh, something that we have control over. We do not have control over our, our wills. They are constrained. And this is a fact. Now, we can walk through this in scripture, and I'll kind of walk through this logically with you and think about it. But Augustine really put this well. He talked about in this uh, Latin work here, De Corruptione e Gratia. He presents this uh, fourfold distinction between our ability and our will. And it, it meshes quite nicely with what we're talking about. So let's take a look at this. Augustine posited four different states. The first state is in the Garden of Eden before the fall of humanity. And he said, in that state, humanity was not able, was able not to sin. Passe non peccare, able not to sin. The way we can think about this is they could choose. They could, they could sin or not sin. Adam and Eve could sin, they could not sin. They didn't sin, but then ultimately they did sin and that resulted in the fall. And with the fall, and this is a key aspect of understanding free will, with the fall comes corruption and original sin. And our, our bodies and our souls, our minds are corrupted because of sin. And in this state, in the state, the fallen state of humanity, we are not able not to sin. Non passe, non peccare. We are not able not to sin. In other words, we are only able to sin. Without God's grace, all we can do is sin. We can't do anything else. And so our will wants to sin. We do exactly what we want, but we are not able. We have, we have inability to do what is good because of sin. And remember, sin is the fault of us humans. And the third state is a state of redemption in which, again, we are able not to sin. Passe non peccare. We can choose to sin or not to sin. Because of God's grace, we cannot sin. And then the fourth state is the state in heaven, which is where we are not able to sin. Non passe peccare. We won't be able to sin. Now, here's what I think you should think about. If you don't think it is fair that our will is constrained, okay? Think about the new heavens and the new earth. In the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no sin. 
The reason why there will be no sin is because we will have the ability to sin taken away. Our wills will be constrained. We will not be able to sin. God, in his mercy, will remove that corruption from us, and we will not even be able to sin in our glorified state. Now, would anybody say that that's not fair? No, I don't think anybody would say that. Well, maybe some would, but I wouldn't. If the, if the possibility of sin was taken away, and that means all the, the death and misery that comes along with sin, all the suffering that comes with it is gone, I'll sign up for that. I think you'll sign up for it too. And so if it is the case that in the new heavens and the new earth, after the Lord returns and the resurrection of the dead, if it is the case that we will not be able to sin, then why isn't it the case now that our wills are also constrained? And they are. We have a we have a fallen, broken nature, and even if we're redeemed, our our nature is still corrupted. We still possess a measure of that corruption until we're resurrected. And so our we do have free will, but our wills are constrained by our fallenness and our sin. And this is the very I think elegant and biblical solution to the problem of free will and sovereignty. The answer is we do have free will, but what we can will is constrained. And it is only by God's grace and power that our wills can be freed to choose what is good and what is right. So do we have free will? Yes. And the Westminster Confession um, talks about this in more detail in chapter 3. Remember the shorter catechism is short. It goes into more detail here in chapter 3. It says, um, and this has to do with, is God the author of evil? So do we have free will? Yes. Is God the author of evil? No. It says, from all eternity, God did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. That has to do with his providence and his decree. Yet so as nearby, yet so as thereby, neither is God the author of sin. So God decreed everything, but he's not the author of sin. Nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures. Nor is the liberty and or contingency of second causes taken away, but established. So this phrase second causes is important. And we'll look at it in a in this next passage, and we'll see how that does not make God the author of sin because there's something called second causes. So let's look at that. In 5.2, we see this idea of second causes again. Is God the author of evil? No, because of second causes. In 5.2, although in relation to the foreknowledge and decree of God, which is the first cause, so the first cause is God, his foreknowledge, his decree, his providence. That's the first cause. All things immutably come to pass and infallibly. Yet by the same providence, he order them, he orders them to fall out according to the nature of second causes, which is us, our will, our actions as creatures, either necessarily by logical consequence, freely because of our free choice, or contingently because of uh, judgment, you might say, because of God's judgment, because we do something and he, he, he uh, responds to it. So can God be good? Is he the author of evil? No. Can he be good? Yes. Why? Because God uses means. Sometimes God will act without means and work miraculously in the world. That's what we call a miracle when God doesn't use means. But almost always God uses means to carry out his, his, his providence. And that's what second causes are. Second causes are people, things, bringing about God's, uh, what God has ordered and governed. He, so he uses people, that's a second cause. And we have to remember that because of sin, 
the curse of sin has corrupted the natural world. We read this in Genesis chapter 3. And Genesis chapter 3 is a pretty important um, place to, to look at these, these issues. When we look at Genesis chapter 3, uh, and when God is judging Adam and Eve and the serpent for their sin, we see that the, even the very ground is a part of the judgment. And one way to look at it is that the ground prosecutes the curse. Eve is going to have pain in childbearing. Adam is going to bring forth uh, food by the sweat of his brow. And, um, and thorns and thistles are going to come. And we see that the very ground is going to be a part of prosecuting the curse. So the curse of sin has consequences on the natural world. So when we see pandemic, COVID-19, God is not the author of that in the sense that he's the author of all the evil and death, suffering. He allows it to happen. It's a part of his plan. But the reason why COVID-19 exists is because of the curse of sin. Same thing for hurricanes, earthquakes, any other natural disaster. They are not God's fault. They are a part of the curse that is a result of our sin. It's our fault. Those things are because of our sin. So it's not... God who's the author of evil. But that would be a consequence of sin in the world that he brings about. So God allows sinful humanity to make sinful choices. So when people do sinful things, he allows that. We have free will. He doesn't he does he does constrain with his law in the world so that things do not become completely unlivable and horrible, but the things that do happen are when evil people make evil choices, including us, because we, we're sinners, even though we may be redeemed. And so God is not the author of evil, and he is good. We have to remember he uses means. The natural world is a part of the curse. Because the natural world is corrupted because of the curse. And we have to remember that God allows sinful humanity to make sinful choices. So, returning back to the question. God's works of providence are his preserving and governing all the creatures and all their actions. But going back to those adjectives, his most holy, wise, and powerful. So God's preserving and governing is according to his holiness and his wisdom, which is very good. Let's take a look at a few scriptures which will uh, bear all these things out. We'll do this quickly as uh, our time is running short. So one thing to remember is that the Bible uses the word almighty. And almighty means all powerful. We're used to the word almighty as a name for God. But remember, the word almighty in Greek is pantokrator, the Latin omnipotens is where we get the word omnipotent. The name almighty means that God is all powerful. The very fact that he's called almighty in the scriptures means that he is all powerful, has all power, all power, everything. So here's a few verses. Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God. And it says that he is the Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. In Revelation 19.6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude. And it says that uh, like the sounds of many waters, of peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord God, our omnipotent, reigns. So he is almighty and he reigns. He is exercising his power. Sovereignty, active sovereignty, exercising his power and reigning. So we have this idea of, idea of almighty in the scripture. We also have the notion of all things. So he is all mighty and he also uh, has sovereignty over all things here's a few scriptures that show us this first corinthians 8 6 yet for us there is one god the father from whom are all things and for whom we exist and one lord jesus christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist so all things are through god and we exist first timothy 6 13 i charge you in the presence of god who gives life to all things 
Hebrews 2.10, for it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist. For whom and by whom all things exist. Revelation 4.11, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So he created all things, and all things exist because of God, and through him all things continue to exist. Hebrews 1.3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. All things are upheld. So that all things were created by him, and all things continue to exist through him, and all things are, are sustained or upheld through the word of his power. And here's one last scripture that speaks of the all-encompassing nature of his omnipotence and this is the the key text from colossians that speaks of the preeminence of christ paul writes for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible where the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities in other words everything he just makes sure you know it's everything all things were created all things were created through him and for him speaking of jesus the son of god and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So everything was created by him. Everything holds together by him. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So this is a key section that leaves us no doubt that God's almighty power is active in preserving and governing all things. That's going to be it for this week as the children's catechism questions I'm going to save for next time because they have to do with Adam and Eve. And so we'll cover those questions next time. And I hope that you enjoyed our little foray into God's sovereignty together.